right. OK, so um, I wanted to talk about the crisis of liberal civilization. And um, in a way, this might seem a little bit anachronistic to some because uh, the pandemic has had its uh, woeful effects. But one of the effects it's had has been to um, tilt the center of political gravity back towards the center in a way. Um, back towards the technocrats, the bureaucrats, and I think that's partly to do with the, something about the way in which biopolitics works. However, I suggest those effects are largely conjunctural, so I'm going to proceed as if uh, the um, huge um, uh, civilizational storm that was underway until the uh, pandemic began, and which in some ways precipitated it, um, is still afoot. So, the convection cells of this storm have been gathering more or less in plain view. We can uh, name the punctuating moments, the invasion of Iraq, the global credit crunch, the rise of the disaster nationalists, you know, Modi, Trump, Duterte, Bolsonaro. We can say that in the background, there was the hardening of the state against civil rights, the hardening of mass opinion against scapegoats, uh, a social disaster named neoliberalism, more in a moment on that, an ecological disaster now bearing its fruit in the form of uh, wildfires, polar perturbations, mass extinction, and of course, zoonotic disease outbreaks. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, patterns of violence, because that's obviously relevant here. Alain Berto uh, documents a surge in worldwide terror events since the 2003 invasion of Iraq and a crescendo of civic violence since the 2008 financial crash. Of interest to me in particular is that between the 1970s and the 2000s, the number of lone wolf attacks each year increased by 143%. By 2016, the number for the 2010s was already more than double that for the 2000s. So we have the increasing rate of increase. And on the S curve of diffusion, this pinpoints the moment where a contagion is taking off. And given the viral spread, uh, the lone wolf manifesto being the medium for a contagion, it was probably inevitable that we would see the armed shitstorm the meat space equivalent of volatile online exchanges, which is what we saw just last year at the Capitol in the United States. So if you happen to own a, a set of pearls, I ask you not to clutch them. I just want you to consider this one dimension of violence. Uh, in this case, it's not strategic, it's not tactical, it is an anti-tactic. It often has no definable political objective. Thinking about Khalid Massoud dashing toward the House of Commons, two large blades in hands, to do what? Think of the red pilled and the red pill curious rushing into the Capitol building to finally confront the cabal. And then what? Finding only tired, frightened, well heeled bureaucrats, not uh, the great Satan. The election of the disaster nationalists almost always came with the overt promise of some sort of redemptive violence. So we had Duterte's death squad populism aimed at the poor, popular with the poor, indeed offered as a kind of class up uplift. If we can destroy these drug dealers and drug addicts, you'll be better off for it. The nation will be better off for it. National uplift too. Uh, Modi's pogroms against Muslims and leftists, part of a sort of muscular project for Indian development. Trump's dialectic of radicalization with the militias and the QAnon LARPers, uh, particularly coming to the fore um, during the uh, Black Lives Matter uprising, but beginning notably with the struggle against uh, pandemic controls. Bolsonaro's unleashing of police and agribusiness violence against indigenous people, against the poor. And I just uh, suggest that um, uh, this is really a story of civilization and its discontents. Freud, uh, writing on the eve of the Great Depression, asked why we seem to despise civilization despite its rewards. And he suggested really that it asked too much of us. It forces us to control our aggression, our sexuality, what really makes us alive to the point where we become miserably neurotic. And uh, in a notable phrase, he said, if the loss is not made good economically, he was referring to psychic economy, but we could think of it in other ways too. You can be sure of disturbances, and he knew of which he spoke. Freud neglected among the sources of civilized misery, work. The single biggest source of stress, the thief of leisure and libido and of life expectancy, and not just work, specifically working for others. There were um, famous studies on workplace stress uh, known as the White Whitehall studies. Um, which busted the myth that managers, because they have the most responsibility, are the most stressed out. 
they actually turned out to be the most relaxed, competent, in control, at home in their world. And the stress and the associated physical symptoms actually increased the further you went down the chain, which is to say in a fashion that hierarchy is a killer. The worldly confidence and civility of the bosses is bought at the expense of years of life taken from those at the bottom. Now, what's particularly lethal about hierarchy is that you can always fall further down the great chain of being. And neoliberalism, which I mentioned, uh, by intensifying inequality, also increases the cost of failure. It makes the downward plunge that bit steeper. The sociologist T.H. Marshall suggested that we become aware of ourselves through comparison with others. And he was talking about class resentment. Uh, you could think of this as a kind of anxious status checking, or as uh, the psychologist Oliver James once put it, death by a thousand social comparisons. By producing an emulous and sadistic culture of winners and losers, neoliberalism also makes the slide more toxic and more humiliating. I think about, um, you know, one of the major winners of the neoliberal era was, of course, Donald Trump, whose uh, libidinal high in his uh, show, The Apprentice, was when he pointed to someone and said, you're fired. The libidinizing of sadism is very relevant here. Neoliberalism, however, is often very difficult to, to define, and I'm not going to attempt it here, um, although I have some ideas on this, but just to say that in its axioms, it is generalized paranoia. Weaning its subjects off what it regards as primitive egalitarianism, it asserts that every claim for the social or public interest is selfish hypocrisy, a power move. There is only a generalized pseudo-Darwinian struggle for existence. Its motto could be, they're all out to get you. The air of neoliberalism, as Adam Kotzko suggests, is as thick with demons as the heir of the me medieval era and the early modern era of witch hunts. Let me draw your attention back to the 6th of January rioters. Um, research at the time by Robert Pape showed that the vast majority of those present were not actually the, the usual suspects organized in militias and QAnons and what have you. They were disproportionately drawn from the downwardly mobile business and professional classes. They had done well out of the boom years only to be hurled into debt and even bankruptcy. They were at risk of being relegated to the status of ordinary struggling humanity. The right mostly in historical terms and today recruits from those just above the bottom of the pile. The people at the bottom generally are the most insulated from the far right's appeal. The lower middle class, um, the downwardly mobile recently affluent and slightly better off workers uh, tend to be the demographic here. Um, these would be the, the little men of whom Wilhelm Reich wrote, uh, enslaved, craving authority, but also rebellious at the same time. And also, I think significantly terrified of the void. And what is the void if not the uh, ensemble that Lacan wrote about, the abyss of the other, a difference to which one cannot be indifferent. The right's defense against the abyss of equality which interestingly, they often represent as the abyss of uh, lack of difference, um, you know, similitude, everybody being reduced to the same, the mishmash society, as the apartheid intellectual Jeffrey Cronier put it, the impoverishment of being, the reduction of humanity to a pulpy mass of shit, has historically been race. In this uh, sort of heuristic, race is the cellular, organic, and skeletal structure that keeps hierarchy alive in a democratic age by offering the white working class, um, a problematic term, uh, a share in mastery. But there's always been the danger that as the social and psychological wages of whiteness decline, that whites and blacks and everyone else begin to feel more similar. This was Jeffrey Cronier's fear, and also that of David Starkey, the historian, when he spoke during the 2011 England riots and said, the whites are becoming black. And so apartheid, the system that so fascinated Thomas Mayer, the lone wolf of Britain first, who murdered Labour MP Joe Cox, was a defensive formation in that regard. Now, <clears throat> as racial domination is challenged today, um, the new far right fears white extinction. And the cognate of this is the abyss known as communism. Now, anti-communism has always been hallucinatory, a dream world, even when communism had considerably more historical force than it does today. In the far right's dream world, and not only that of the far right, communism tends to be a sort of 
um, tentacular monster of monsters under the cover of democracy or republicanism or women's rights or wokeness or gender ideology. It's accused of destroying civilization through its liquidation of the inequalities that give being its structured dignity in differences. Now, um, since communism is regarded today by the far right as being consubstantial with political and corporate power, since capitalism is woke and the UN is woke and McDonald's is accused of being in league uh, with the uh, gay rights activists and all the rest of it, it can be accused of having betrayed the white working class. It's now an elite project. And note the working class here are betrayed rather than exploited because what they have lost is the dignity and honor of being white. The wages of whiteness in decline as a result of uh, the offensive of communism. Throughout class society, the theologian William Connolly says, flow the underground ethos of existential revenge. For those who are constantly dangling over the abyss, ontological self-confidence can be secured through small acts of revenge. You can do this as a member of one of those armored bodies, uh, such as the police, uh, as a debt collector, as a supervisor, a middle manager, maybe a, a member of one of those moral professions wielding soft power. Um, there are all sorts of ways to exact small acts of revenge on other uh, layers of humanity. Neuroscientists uh, tell us that the secretion of glucocorticoids, the hormone responsible for our fight or flight responses when we're put under great stress or attacked, can be mitigated through displacement aggression. The idea is you kick me, I kick sm someone smaller, I feel a bit of relief. But of course, you know, there's no simple causal pathways here. As uh, Robert Sapolsky points out, um, this only really applies if one is already socially and culturally primed to respond to aggression with aggression. In other words, if one inhabits uh, a mandatory paranoia as we tend to do in the neoliberal context. Except that from the point of view of reactionary politics, Liberal civilization is, for all its exclusions and oppressions, far too repressive in another way. It offers far too few means to blow off steam. It used to be that in generational struggles, the young accuse the old of being too restrictive or preventing them from enjoying their lives. Now it's the old who fear they've lost their enjoyment, lost their birthright, lost the right to be a bit racist, transphobic, sexist, to burn fossil fuels, to enjoy the benefits of capitalism without being lectured about it. Um, the subtlety of reaction is to offer an adventure in selective de-civilization as a cure, not just for this sense of loss, but for the depression of late capitalism. The happiness industry gives you pills, it gives you mindfulness, it gives you CBT. But if depression is, as uh, Will Davies puts it, a generalized collapse of desire, the new right revives desire as a desire to know one's place and to secure it by destroying a neighbor. So if the air is indeed thick with demons, it names them, it arms you against them. I want you to think about the um, lone wolf uh, attacker uh, from Wales who drove his, uh, uh, who rented a van and drove it into a crowd of Muslims outside Finsbury Park Mosque. Uh, he had been a long suffering alcoholic. Uh, he had mental health issues. He was unemployed. He wasn't well regarded by anybody. Um, he was obviously somebody who had serious problems. He one, uh, one evening watched a, a BBC documentary about uh, child grooming gangs in the north of England, uh, identified the problem as Muslims, uh, went on to Tommy Robinson's YouTube channel, was um, radicalized, as they say. He became addicted. He was thrilled by this because his demons were given a name and he was empowered to do something about it. He described himself increasingly as a soldier against Islam. The right understands that from within a political horizon established by the exclusions of liberal civilization itself and its traditional consolations, which is to kick someone else, there is a, a material interest here. And that material interests go far beyond bread. They include enjoyment, to be freed a bit from the constraints of civilization, to be recognized for once, even if only by a master, to be erotically electrified by the same master, to be permitted a certain amount of aggression by the same master, to have one's destructive energy or so-called death drive, not shamed, but socially rewarded. To go out and do something as Kyle Rittenhouse did, uh, absolutely um, 
prohibited by society and to have it lauded and defended and made a source of pride. We ignore enjoyment at our peril. We must not, of course, uh, over-rationalize, denigrate fantasy, disavow our own sustaining mythologies, because in that way we become more um, uh, enthralled by them. We mustn't moralize about civility or cleave to parliamentary protocol in the hope that all these questions uh, around enjoyment will just disappear if people have enough bread. It's not bread, by and large, that people are missing. It's enjoyment of life. It's the ability to live and enjoy life. The question then is how to work with the grain of uh, resentments, which often have a real basis, how to work with enjoyment, how to work the drives, death drives included, without it turning murderous and destroying the things that we value. That's it. Thanks so much for that, Richard. Um, next, uh, Lynn. Well, that is a hard act to follow. Thank you, Richard. That was really terrific. I think I'll, I'll probably be picking up on the hierarchy is a killer part of, uh, of what you were talking about. So I am going to um, share my screen and do my um, version of a PowerPoint, which is not, <laughs> not fabulous, but um, let's see. Uh, whoops. Okay, the only problem is I don't know how to move them. There we go, okay. Oh, whoops, oh, back. All right, so I'm calling this uh, psychoanalytic activism in neoliberal times. And I'm really going to be focusing in on, uh, also on subject formation in um, neoliberal hierarchical structures and, um, and, in, and on the clinic. And I wanted to start with this slide from a, um, a talk that Dr. Janet Helms, who's in the upper right-hand corner, gave on what she called white heterosexual male privilege and pronounced wimp. Um, and her point was to, um, uh, to separate this structure from racism and to argue that all of the um, symptoms from which we suffer um, are a result of white heterosexual male privilege. And I, I will be talking um, about one particular piece of how white heterosexual male privilege operates throughout the talk, which is the, um, uh, the splitting off of uh, capacities for relationality and care and mutuality, which leaves a particular kind of subjectivity based in uh, what's, what psychoanalysts call uh, defensive autonomy. And, um, and in thinking about any kind of social psychoanalysis, I think, um, you know, and again, uh, actually this just came up in, in the Psychoanalytic Institute that I'm part of, uh, anyone who talks about anti-racism, anti-classism is considered to be speaking ideologically, whereas that uh, tolerant middle that Richard described as not having enough enjoyment, um, I'm not sure I totally agree with that, um, the tolerant middle is not speaking from an ideology, and uh, we are considered the, the extremists. And that tolerant middle um, practices a particular kind of psychoanalysis in the United States, and I think probably also in the UK, and that is one that separates the psychic from the social. And um, what I and many others argue, um, including Danielle, is that that particular split is a pro product of capitalism. It's a product of a racialized capitalism, and it works to reproduce uh, a liberal individualist status quo. Um, I first started thinking about uh, how identity is shaped within particular cl uh, classist, racist, sexist um, hierarchies based in my own experience, which I think is how, how most theorizing begins. And my own experience growing up uh, in the 50s and 60s was to uh, mostly to experience pain in the realm of gender inequality, um, somewhat class inequality, uh, definitely not racial inequality because I lived in a completely segregated neighborhood. Um, and, and what I did experience though were particular ways of being that were considered, that were given social approval, that were given love, that were given care for a middle-class white female. And um, what was valued was relationality and not rocking the boat. And what was devalued was um, uh, any kind of agency uh, 
um, or uh, all assertiveness was considered aggression, actually. Um, anger was considered uh, too aggressive and you're not then a proper girl and you don't receive uh, love and care. So um, by the time I got to college, I was uh, uh, met with, I met with the feminist movement. So which drew on other parts of my identity that I had, had suppressed. Um, so there's where I see the, the, the possibilities for resistance, the things that we're encouraged to split off, the human capacities that we're encouraged to split off as we grow up in these hierarchies, they don't disappear. They become monstrous versions um, of uh, human capacities at times and are enacted in relationships in um, uh, uh, damaging, sadistic ways. Um, but they but they don't disappear and they're available for resistance. So um, when I got into uh, my own analysis, um, having suffered between the, the psychic struggle of feminism versus what I was raised to be, um, I found that I was, uh, what was helpful to me was to be able to integrate, reintegrate capacities for uh, relationality, capacities for care with agentic capacities in such a way that neither of them was monstrous. And as I ended my analysis and described that to a friend of mine, she sent me this, uh, this card. Oh my God, I think I'm becoming the man I wanted to marry. Um, which shows not only what you've done to yourself by splitting off these capacities that are not desirable, but also how it functions in relationship. You're supposed to marry the person who's got, for the, when I was growing up, you're supposed to marry the person who has agency and enjoy his agency um, and not, not express it yourself. And that leads, in, in my case, I recall um, a lot of projection, a lot of hatred of men who were able to, to experience their assertion. Um, and, and a virtuous, virtuous feeling for not being able to uh, assert myself. So, so the first things I started thinking about when I was um, beginning to write about what identity formation is like in, um, uh, in, in, our, in our time, well, this, this time was in the 90s, uh, I, I noticed some um, writings where I saw therapists actually either colluding with a patient to reproduce uh, uh, the damage that's already been done in these cultural hierarchies, reproducing sexism, racism, classism, or sometimes just introducing it themselves. And the first uh, paper I noticed that led me to um, move from thinking about, well, the first, first such paper was a, a white male analyst in his 40s, I think, who was treating a white, um, a younger white female. And what I and the student I was working with noticed is that um, in his interpretations, um, in the things that he shared with the reader, wh what he was thinking, uh, he was actually disallowing this woman to be anything but dependent, definitely um, subduing any moves of hers towards agency. And in her own expression of enjoyment of her body, he would reduce it to desirability to a male. So this put me onto the idea of how therapists can actually not sometimes not just collude with a patient. This patient started getting depressed as soon as this started going on. Um, not only collude, but actually initiate. And sometimes he, in this paper, he would share with the reader, for example, his own dependency on the patient. But when he, when he was talking to the patient, only she was allowed to be the dependent person in the room. So I started theorizing about uh, what I call the heterosexist unconscious, but then after several people started writing about racial enactments in the clinic um, of the kind that I was just describing, class enactments in the clinic, I brought in the term to, <clears throat> to normative unconscious processes that occur, and, and these are the processes that reproduce what happens um, in identity formations within unequal power hierarchies and the hierarchies do kill because the enforcement of, uh, of finding your place and being a proper girl or being a pop proper boy um, is to be shamed and humiliated. There's the sadism also that Richard was talking about and that these lead to the splitting off of undesirable states um, uh, to, to attain the right identity for your um, own social location. Um, so, in, then I mostly I was writing about these kinds of enactments that happen in the clinic um, and uh, um, 
and I now am seeing it in, in terms of doing a lot of work in psychoanalytic institutes, like I was describing uh, earlier, I see it happening there as well. So I guess probably around the early 2000s, um, I started thinking about, I, I was reading Deb Wan and Godier's book, History Beyond Trauma, and saw that they were talking about the big history in which patient and therapists are all caught up. And I think probably this was, it was probably more around like 2009, 10 um, with the Occupy movement. So the important connections again between uh, uh, clinical thinking and what's going on in the culture, the radical inequality that was um, beginning to be uh, put on everybody's radar screen started making me think of how patients and therapists are not only working with these um, within these unequal hierarchies, these overlapping oppressions that are intersectional, but are also uh, all part of um, a bigger history um, with, with its own particular psychic effects. So I started writing about neoliberalism and I don't think I really need to go into it for this audience and particularly um, because Richard has done such a good job talking about it. Um, this is particularly focused on the United States what I, what I just want to point to, and, I, and again, Richard touched on this too, um, neoliberalism in the United States is thought of as being instantiated with these kinds of things that I've listed here, tax cuts for the wealthy, deregulation of industry and finance, around 1980 when, when Reagan came, uh, became president. However, um, what I've learned subsequently is that, uh, is how this is really a racialized um, uh, uh, capitalist um, event um, because the wealthy elites and politicos and economists were really contesting the uh, welfare state in the United States from the time of the New Deal. And however, they were not able really to get popular support for their attacks on big government to begin dismantling big government until the civil rights movement of the 1950s. Um, and then they were, then these elites were able to, via racism um, and via white people's uh, contempt for desegregation, for example, in Brown versus Board of Education, um, that's really where the bandwagon began for um, attacking the welfare, for popular support for attacking the welfare state. Reagan also um, was notoriously racist as well. And, and so here's where the, um, starting with his policies, uh, you, you would begin to see what Ruth Wilson Gilmore has called the organized abandonment of vulnerable populations. So this vast economic inequality, the um, demand to repudiate vulnerability uh, lead to what I think of as some of the psychic effects of neoliberalism. Um, which have been well documented by many sociologists, um, unfortunately not as many psychologists, uh, for example, the individual as entrepreneur of the self. So these are the values that you're, that all in this culture now, it's the, it's the values of defensive autonomy, it's the values of WIMP that now everyone in the culture is um, called upon to incarnate, uh, that competition and self-interest are valued over care, Better human is the richer human. Um, economic success is the only thing that's important. That vulnerability is shameful in all groups. And I remember a patient of mine speaking to the racial capitalist part of this so beautifully when she said, so she's someone who grew up in the eighties. She said her parents gave her the clear message that uh, her life trajectory was either Yale or jail. In other words, you go to an Ivy League institution or you end up in jail. And that is precisely what was happening in the United States. The upper middle class is aspiring towards Yale. Um, I could go into what's happening now in schools, but I won't. Uh, and, um, and mass incarceration takes, takes uh, huge leaps at, at the same time for, um, uh, for BIPOC populations, particularly black populations. Um, so, uh, I don't have time to show this, unfortunately, but um, it, it's there's a sketch comedy called Portlandia that some of you may have seen. Um, and I think that the, their episode on Grover is per, gives particular insight into um, white subject formation, not just as valuing certain things, but also as devaluing, as having contempt um, for other groups. And again, Richard spoke to some of this 
point beautifully. Grover is seated at a table. His parents are showing him a chart um, that, that uh, charts his, the successes he will have if he gets into the private preschool that he's about to have an interview for that day. And um, the chart for success moves from getting into the preschool. You look at Grover, he looks kind of depressed, which is also a part of this picture. Um, the successes go up to an Ivy League college uh, and to having a lot of money and then at the top um, to having a Ferrari. They then put up a chart of uh, failure and that includes hanging around a public school with all those lower class kids, going to a community college, um, shooting birds and squirrels for dinner, the mother says. Anyway, he's in being encouraged to have contempt for anything but the upper middle white class, the white upper middle class. And he is, as, a, as you can see, getting more and more depressed. Nonetheless, he knows exactly what success is supposed to look like. In the clinic, let's, let me just check my time here, which I can't do because I'm in full screen. Um, Lydia, would you give me, uh, when, <laughs> when I'm getting close to time, let me know. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to give one example here of how this turns up in the clinic, and this is, I've heard many a case like this, where an upper middle class white student, lots of pressure to perform, this happens, as I said again, for the entire population who's looking to higher education, she does fabulously this particular, in this particular case, she does fabulously in the first semester, getting all A's, model student, second semester, she binges, she purges, she's um, drinking too much, She's not getting her work done. She's about to get suspended. The therapist feels very much pulled upon to help her finish her papers. The parents are calling the therapist to ask the therapist to intervene. Um, this is, would not be a terribly uh, a sophisticated psychoanalytic move to actually do the papers, but there's a lot of pressure on the therapist to do that. And um, what I have argued is that Looking at just the symptoms that the patient is showing in the second semester and helping with those symptoms really does end up again, reproducing a neoliberal subjectivity because what you have to look at are the pressures to perform in the first semester as also a part of the symptom picture. And that is not what, what most therapists who are again in this big history of neoliberalism and accept that getting all A's and you know, performing well is, is healthy. Um, uh, will not notice that as symptomatic. Um, in terms of resistance, I'm just going to say a few things here to, to end. Uh, there's a case that I would point people to that Nancy Hollander talks about in an issue of psychoanalytic dialogues. And I really particularly point to this case because it's one of the few that talk in the psychoanalytic literature um, that talk about race in a white, white dyad, dyad and how one can both either one can collude with reproducing an unequal racist, a racist status quo, or one can resist it. And the case starts out, Nancy is a white upper middle class woman, therapist working with a white upper middle class lawyer um, who comes in complaining that her child loves the Latinx nanny more than she loves her and she's feeling very envious. And part of the, the beginning part of the work is to focus on the familial issues. So this is the classic psychoanalytic model where the social world doesn't really come into it. It's just what happened in this woman's family and how she would end up being envious. And then after that's worked on some, Nancy recognizes that something has been left out of the frame and that is the subjectivity of the nanny. And as Nancy starts to um, bring the subjectivity of the nanny into the treatment, the patient recognizes that she's paying her low, way lower wages than her own social conscience would, uh, would allow for, and comes to recognize that the um, horrific neoliberal workplace that she's working in that demands 24 seven work from her is super hierarchical um, and where shit rolls downhill is now rolling downhill onto, onto the nanny. So I, I see this as this case as one a possible example of a um, activist psychoanalytic resistance to a neoliberal status quo. In terms of the culture, I think um, what the Red Clinic is doing is where I would look right now for, uh, for uh, an activism um, that is resistant to, to capitalism because um, 
uh, you know, while I think there are some suggestions that, for example, union activity is increasing in the United States, there's some anti-neoliberal moves going on here, although, I mean, within a, a horrific culture that I also don't have time to go into. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that union labor struggles are where the most radical um, work is being done. I really think it's in solidarity economy work um, that includes worker-owned cooperatives and whole ecosystems of solidarity economy organizations. Um, so I think I will just end uh, there, but also with some, um, uh, you know, some core principles of what I think of as a psychoanalytic activism, um, which I've already spoken to mostly. Contextualize, contextualize, contextualize. What's the big history? What, what reckon with your own social location? How have you lived uh, your race, racial, gender, and sexual identities? What have you split off to become the right kind of person? I'll conclude with um, a question that I heard an African-American woman pose at the end of a webinar that was, uh, I think it was a solidarity economy webinar. What would you be like if you lived outside the frame of patriarchy and white supremacy? Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Lynn. Uh, I, I know I have a lot of questions. Um, I would love to throw at both you and Richard apropos of the uh, overlap between your talks after. Um, but, but before we get to that, uh, I'm very excited uh, for Danielle to present. So I'll let you take it away. Great, thank you so much, Cordelia. And thanks so much again to the Learning Cooperative for inviting us to have this dialogue today. I just wanna check right quick, can everybody hear me? Is the audio coming through okay? Okay, great. Uh, let me just say right quick, I am a psychoanalytic uh, practitioner in training. I'm still in school. I haven't left my uh, play couch yet. So I just wanna clarify that right off the bat, make sure I'm not, not giving false impression of being full-blown psychoanalyst. Okay, with that out of the way, I want to kind of talk aloud with folks here, both with the panelists and with the audience, about ways that I'm trying to think through how this whole kit and caboodle comes together. So I'm going to share with you some very discombobulated thoughts on what I'm calling a history of racial capitalism from psyche to society, part one. And yes, it's very much inform informed and influenced by Mill Brooks' classic film, History of the World, part one. And what I want to do is share a couple of stories, a story about the psyche, a story about our world, all leading up to a story about why we suffer. I wanna tell these three stories in tandem because I think in ways that have been alluded to by both Richard and Lynn, um, particularly in my field, clinical psychology, there is a way in which in our training, you're taught to learn something called psychotherapy. And then later on in your training, you're, learn, you're taught to learn something called cultural competence. So that if you're doing psychotherapy with, let's say, white clients, men, middle upper class patients, cis heterosexual people, then you're going to do psychotherapy. But if you're going to work with people of color, people who are poor, people who are LGBT and women, then you're going to do something called cultural competence. And that embedded within that are two very different discourses of suffering. And what I want to do is paint a picture, not just of the psyche, but of the world that helps us understand why we suffer in a way that is integrated, not just in the clinic, but also out in the streets. So to tell you that first story, I want to go back to basics and provide you with a, a synthesis of Freud's classic paper, The Unconscious, through the lens of basic science. Now, I'm not going to review every jot and tittle of The Unconscious, but I do want to reread it through a contemporary scientific lens. Now, when it comes to the functioning of the brain and the mind and how it's evolved, there's a, a lot of building research showing that our capacity for language evolved from the brain's sensory and motor systems. What that means is that our sense of who we are and how we communicate emerges from the parts of our psyches that track the body in three-dimensional physical and geographic space. And that this capacity contextually evolved in the context of what are called alloparental arrangements in nominally, as I'll complexify in just a moment, hunter-gathering societies. That our capacity to mentalize, to read other minds in order to care for them, 
or to read other minds to see where they are in the pecking order so we can control and exploit them, evolved from us being in dialogue with others, particularly multiple caregivers outside of a traditional nuclear family dyadic context. What this means is that language is related to our bodily orientation in time and space. So basically, when we feel warmly towards someone, our bodily temperature rises. Consider when you say to someone, I feel closer to you. That's not simply a metaphor. Our brain's representation of our body actually starts to track us as if we're physically closer to that person, even if we're relating to each other through a Zoom screen. Similarly, when we feel socially excluded, we feel physiologically colder and our brain maps us out as such. There's been some very interesting research showing that as we're walking throughout the world, the hippocampus in particular maps a three-dimensional model of self and other organized around warmth. So how much closer do we feel or distant do we feel from another person, but also organized around status. So whenever we're walking out and about our world, even in a three-dimensional um, space or a virtual space such as this one, we're always even unconsciously getting a sense of where we are on some given positionality. To give a very quick example, uh, one of my students of color once shared being in a class on Zoom and noticing that they were the only non-white face in the gallery view. And even though nobody was saying overtly, you don't belong here, what was derived from that space was that maybe they actually don't. Now, ambiguity in culture outside of our immediate psyches mediate the accessibility of these embodied cognitions and their unconscious associations. In a US sample, for example, if you eat a delicious sweet and then you're asked to appraise a stranger, you're much more likely to see them as sweet. In other words, when you consume something that's associated with the taste of sweetness, we're likely to transfer that over onto ambiguous relationships and see them as sweet, kind, and gentle people. But in other uh, cultural contexts, such as in, in Israel, the same study shows that in that context, because sweetness is a metaphor associated with inauthenticity, when participants are provided with a delicious treat, they'll enjoy it, they'll say it's sweet and delicious, but if they're asked to rate a stranger, they'll see them as potentially manipulative. In other words, again, that the body bears an intricate relationship to language and how we position ourselves and read the world around us. That there is a liminal space between the body and language that renders all language as quintessentially body language and that the body's position in symbolic space must then be inherently political. But that we not only track where we are in three-dimensional physical space, but where we are on a given hierarchy. Now, with that story of the mind out of the way, I wanna quickly review some very fascinating findings from the fields of anthropology and archeology span that try to make sense, not just of why inequality exists, but how we get stuck in it. I'm pointing here particularly to Graeber and Wengro's recent work, The Dawn of Everything, uh, A New History of Mankind. They point out in their book how many stories of our social evolution tend to have a kind of linear developmentalist structure. We were hunter-gatherers and we were egalitarian and got along with everybody. And then we discovered uh, carrots and agriculture. And all of a sudden we became hierarchical, patriarchal and so forth. What they find in this very recent review of, uh, of current anthropological research is that human beings throughout our history actually oscillated between these egalitarian systems for keeping power and social comparison in check and hierarchical systems of increasing hierarchy and domination, sometimes within the span of a single year, sometimes in the span of generations. And what they point to here is an incredible capacity for our ancestors, who are really no different from us, to be able to imagine different social arrangements given not only material context, but how it is that we represent the world and ultimately what it is that we value that we've come up with systems of hierarchy over and over again, and that there's evidence that shows, particularly in our deep history, that we've abolished 
time and again, those very same systems of hierarchy. In other words, that we don't have truly a linear developmental history of our species, but we should really think of something a bit more complex, fluid, and dynamic. One very powerful example from their book that I, I think speaks to some of the themes we're talking about today is their understanding of the role of enslavement. And we're talking here of pre-Columbian enslavement. So this is before the era of colonialism, digging into our deep history, um, not just digging back to the Bronze Age, but even further back um, to our ancestors. What they basically show is that here again, there's a very interesting relationship between different societies' capacity to imagine different social arrangements, that there were societies that developed systems of enslavement and at times also abolished and turned upside down those systems of enslavement. What, what's very curious about our history is that different populations may rebel and resist systems of enslavement for themselves only to then turn around and impose those very same systems onto other people, okay? That we have a very kind of complex and fluid relationship to who it is that we care for and who it is that we decide to control, exploit, and enslave. They point to a confusion that arises where out of this dynamic fluidity of switching back and forth between social systems, where systems of care and systems of control become blended, okay? Particularly in the intersection of gender and systems of enslavement, where there is incredible violence directed outwards to people outside of the tribe, outside of the community, which then creates the space within the community where there's an expectation for the provision of care, but of care to be provided by subservient others. That you start to have these familial systems where people who are not quite seen as human are nevertheless providing childcare, providing caregiving for certainly many people in a given population, but particularly the elites within a given nation, tribe, or peoples. And that that relationship between those who function as the elites of a given society, the non-enslaved populace who, although exploited, are not entered into the category of the enslaved, and then those who are rendered into what Orlando Patterson would call a category of social death, to be seen as not human and therefore conscribed to the position of enslavement. In our history, particularly with the advent now speaking to the colonial era and the ways in which the colonial era facilitates a certain kind of capitalist development, you have a shift from one world in which people are engaging in various forms of conquest, resistance against conquest and liberation into a world that starts to associate the position of enslavement with a singular group of people. Um, I'll, I'll never forget when I learned the story of Bartolome de las Casas, the Spaniard friar who on the one hand fought for and debated the humanity of the indigenous people of the Caribbean and certainly my ancestors of Borique in Puerto Rico, the Taino, in arguing that, that the Spaniards should not subject the Taino to brutal violence and enslavement because they have a soul, they're children of God, they're human. But since there is still a need for both the political, economic, and libidinal importance of enslavement. He argued that, however, African peoples did not, did not have a soul, were not human, and were in a sense born to be enslaved. And this was an idea that was percolating, at least from 625 AD leading up to the colonial era, that essentially got further concretized through the colonial project, which essentially stated, that there is one group of people, people from Africa, who are born to be enslaved, which then allows a category of the free, which then became congealed under the category of whiteness. When we talk about racial capitalism in this context, we're not really talking about one thing. We're talking about the convergence of different predispositions, systems, and practices over time that certainly became racialized insofar as race was created as a construct, but that I believe is continuing to evolve today in ways that are um, no less distressing and disturbing. And we can talk about some of the details perhaps in the Q&A. My, my basic thesis here 
is that our capacity to imagine different social arrangements, including social arrangements that provide care for all of us, becomes further and further rigidified, where we become oriented from systems of care and caregiving to systems of increasing hierarchy, where we just get the measure of one another. If we look forward now into our world today, and I think here I'll dovetail with a lot of things that have already been stated by Lynn and Richard, um, thinking particularly of the year 1619 up to the 1850s, you had the birth of what's grown to be called strategic political racism, certainly across the world, but specifically in the US context. That racism should not be understood primarily as an individual bias or prejudice or even an individual phenomena, but rather that it needs to be understood as a tool of political and libidinal economic power. I've been particularly taken with uh, Von Gross's recent book, um, The First Reconstruction, where he provides what I would like to call a non-monolithic account of whiteness and white supremacy. In, in essence, what he shows is that leading up to the American Revolution and after, it's not that every singular white person just signed up to whiteness, but there was actually, again, a kind of fluidity between those white people who certainly signed up to anti-blackness and whiteness and many white people who engaged in allegiances with black people and indigenous people to essentially overturn the power of the ruling class. And that that fluidity is something that needed to be destroyed by political and economic elites through the use of racism as a wedge tool with some of the major components being that one should fear black people and people of color to not trust coalitional solidarity work, to not trust the government as a source of care and aid, and to trust, if not the elites, to trust the machinations of the market as the solution to our problems. Leading in turn to what I think Lynn described in, in uh, I think in great detail, neoliberal policy and neoliberal restruction, which has been showed to increase health inequalities and lead to higher income inequality with a number of destructive social and health outcomes. Now, what I wanna say in passing is that there is a relationship between public policy and political economy and these dimensions that I described earlier, particularly at the individual level. There's research in particular by Patrick Payne and his associates showing that implicit bias cannot be understood as a stable individual attitude but it's a set of associations and language reflective of structural inequities. Um, one study in particular that I think is quite poignant, showing that when you have structures that have racial and economic inequality, you could do, for example, a uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion course, and that'll maybe shift certain biases for a couple of days, but then after those couple of days, it'll return to what's called an aggregate implicit bias mean. And that that mean is related not to individual dynamics, but the level of inequality in the environment, leading to the suggestion that the best thing we could do to address racism and classism is not really primarily to try to change individual beliefs, but to change social structures as such. What I wanna do in my remaining time is to try to map out how these things are related. So I'm gonna to try to walk you through how what I'm gonna call libidinal economy and political economy relate and intersect. So as stated earlier, there's been a lot of work showing that messages of racial fear are used to trigger status anxiety, certainly overwhelmingly for white people in the US context, but also for many people of color, okay? It's not just white people on one side, people of color on the other, but really these racial fear messages have a way of triggering status anxiety for most of us. And when those anxieties are triggered, this tends to reduce support for redistributive programs and for coalitional work. These messages in turn put politicians into power who then enact both austerity policies benefiting the wealthy, as well as law and order and moral panic policies that harm the most vulnerable in a society. When these policies go into effect, you have on the one hand to be sure greater wealth inequality that does lead to worse psychosocial outcomes as Wilkinson, Pickett and others have shown. But these law and order and moral panic policies also have an effect 
not just in cultural discourse, but on our collective normative unconscious, increasing racial inequality, as well as gender and sex inequality. Now, there's an interaction effect, I would argue here, in that wealth inequality exacerbates racial and gender inequality alongside the role of, say, culture wars of the kind that Richard mentioned earlier. This, of course, leads to negative psychosocial outcomes for ethnic minority um, and other people of color, and of course, negative outcomes for women and LGBTQ people. At the same time, these processes also lead to negative outcomes for white people and for cis heterosexual men. When you increase inequality, this has a kind of ripple effect throughout the entire society. However, these same kind of issues, particularly around race and gender, have been shown to have an almost salubrious effect. It's almost a kind of salve that's provided for different, differently statused groups. I, I would almost call this the, the effects of a kind of boomerang effect politics, where you trigger different kinds of status anxieties and concerns and point out some other as a threat. And then you get that person, whether they're white, men, cis heterosexual people, the middle class or otherwise, to throw a boomerang to try to harm whoever that other is. But like any boomerang, what goes around comes around and winds up hitting you back all over again. And I would say here that there is likely some dynamic that could be understood in terms of jussons, that there are ways in which political economy is supported by the libidinal economy of identity politics, particularly for those who are more privileged. These dynamics together create an environment where social trust becomes destroyed and eviscerated, increasing in turn anxiety about social status and comparison across the board. This not only destroys our capacity for empathy and relatedness, but also leads to more exaggerated dominance and submissive behaviors, precisely the kind of behaviors that we would wind up seeing at the clinic. One could understand social anxiety, not just at mere interpersonal inhibition, but also a perception of the self as being on a lower rank. And similarly, in turn, narcissistic personality disorder as a very exaggerated form of dominance behavior. So here we start to see how these broader social forces then start to trickle down into the intimacy of our lives. This in turn leads to what's been called ambivalent stereotypes based in affiliation and systems of status. Stereotypes about who is it that I can trust? Who is my kin and who is my enemy? Which then through different forms of discrimination, microaggression, and violence, wind up reinforcing negative outcomes for the most vulnerable. But at the same time, because this does trickle down into our normative unconscious processes, it provides kindling precisely for those racial and gender fear messages to be deployed in order to hurt all of us. What I want to suggest in closing is that when we think about suffering in a social context, we can't really stay within the mode of having two different split off and separate ways of talking about suffering. This isn't to say that all our suffering is the same or that we experience the same kind of suffering. But it is to say that our suffering is related. That the reason, for example, in the US context, why young white men might overwhelmingly die from opioid addiction in say Appalachia is because Puerto Ricans in my home context have been overwhelmingly been tested almost like in a laboratory context by the same kind of opioids that there's historically this kind of relationship, almost like being in, in the Titanic. Obviously, when the ship is sinking, those who are closer to the bowel of the ship are gonna get hit first. But unless you have access to a raft, the likelihood is the water is gonna keep rising until all of us, if not most of us, drown. Here, I would cite in passing the work of Heather McGee and also Ian Hany Lopez, who would invite us to think about politics beyond a zero sum game to think about the ways that yes, racism and classism and sexism and cis sexism are used to hurt the most vulnerable, but that they do that in order to build the power 
of the ruling class. So that if we can come together, we can build a society that works for all of us, white, black, or brown, because we all want a better future for our children. Because we all want to not just survive, but to thrive. And we can only do that together. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Danielle. Um, I wanted to give priority to any questions the panelists might have for each other. Um, I, I feel like there, there's so much uh, exciting room for conversation around the um, uses of race, um, nor uh, these sorts of structures, uh, by uh, in service of um, capitalist uh, and ruling class ideology. Um, I don't know if anyone had a, a particular question they'd formulated for, for someone else on the panel. Um, this is, uh, look, I mean, uh, First thing uh, I want to ask is, I beg you guys, both of you, to uh, make your slides available. They seem invaluable. I'd really like to read through them um, at some point. Second thing is, um, I just wanted to ask because, well, um, I, I think this is um, where the um, uh, I think this is where Daniel was going. Um, but I would like to ask you both um, because I talked a lot about you know the negative. Um, uh, sort of uses of fantasy and the drives and uh, sort of uh, reactive emotions that are involved in this. I wonder if you guys have some thoughts, um, because I'm somewhat at sea here, uh, about um, a, a kind of um, working of the unconscious that is uh, geared towards uh, jubilance, um, ecstasy, enjoyment uh, for the benefit of progress, um, rather than us being bogged down in, uh, you know, the sad passions, as it were, um, because this is something that I have, personally, I have real trouble working this out. Yes, yes, I, I, I hear that, and I, I think it's absolutely true. I, I, I didn't really get to um, emphasize this because so much of my work has been done on the oppressive side of uh, what happens to subjectivity. But I, I did allude to the ways that subject formation eludes, um, and, even, and even in my own case, eluded the dominant structure such that when feminism, so when I encountered feminism um, and other social movements, there was already things within me that, uh, that you know, that could ignite can become more, more vital. And that's actually happening for me right now with solidarity economy work. So um, yes, I do think that there's, I, I've always been critical of the post-structuralist move to reduce subjectivity to subjection. I think that was a, a, a real um, uh, problem uh, in, in that fabulous work and then really important work, but that's not all there is to subjectivity. I, I like to think sometimes of a, a Gramscian model of hegemonic forces and counter hegemonic forces and that we have both um, within us. I guess I would add, starting from, uh, I guess, clinical experience and then moving back up to theory, I often find that it's going through the, the pessimism, the darkness, the struggle that you wind up creating a pocket where there, there is no other option but joy. Um, the way it comes up with many clients is getting to a place of, well, given that we're screwed in all of these conceivable ways, what would you want to do? Not what do you have to do to survive or to appease the other, but what would you just want? And oftentimes it, it just kind of comes like, um, uh, not really an inspiration. Like if I were to get fancy inside Garcia Lorca, it's not, um, it's not an angel that brings insight from on high. It's not a muse that inspires you, but it's duende. It's, it's wrestling with that precipice of death where all you're left with is your own desire. And oftentimes that desire is oriented towards something. I want that want could be, I want to be with my loved ones. I want a tomorrow, regardless of whether that tomorrow will come, right? It's almost Gramscian's in the sense of a, a pessimism of the intellect, but an optimism of the will. 
and to use that will to, um, if I could get a little corny here, to just imagine a new world is possible, right? Like if I go to Mark Fisher, there's a way in which the capitalist realism thesis carries a lot of water, right? It brackets our ability to imagine different arrangements, whether in the intimacy of our relationships or in the broader structure of our world. So I think there, um, without becoming a positive psychologist, I think there there's a lot to be said for a restructuring of jouissance, right? Uh, if I go very stereotypically about it, um, I want to get close to others, but I'm afraid of being abandoned, so I will close up and run away, right? Like you're doing that in a way because you're trying to avoid pain, even though it has a negative outcome of feeling isolated. However, if you push through that anxiety, which is painful, there is the possibility of creating something new, right? Connection, relationship, and so forth. So what, what I mean here, and now in the social political level, there's a lot of fears that we have about what it would mean to change things as they are. But if we can develop or, or rather restructure our jouissance in such an extent that we push through that pain, not in the foreclosure that things will be better, but that what's here right now really sucks. And I feel a desire to create something new that brings me joy. Like that, that's what my answer would be to that, that we have to move through the pain and anxiety and allow that pain and anxiety to give us its own joy because there's something else on the other side, a better world or otherwise. Um, I, I was curious, apropos of um, the, the focus in Richard's talk on the use of these desires uh, by the right wing, um, in Lynn's work on, um, and uh, Danielle's as well, uh, in what, what race, um, what these sorts of uh, oppressive structures and discrimination, um, how they manage to serve uh, bourgeois politics uh, in the fashion that they do. I was curious whether anyone feels there's any room um, to elaborate ways in which um, desires um, or, or psychoanalysis in general can be used towards the sorts of political ends you all might have, um, whether in clinical practice or, or in how we think about or, or talk about our politics more broadly. Um, and I know that that's a, a big question. Um, I was just curious to hear um, any insights, any thoughts. Well, I, I don't know if this is a great insight, but I, you know, I really do think that the unconscious is is in part a revolution revolutionary. That unconscious processes disorganize in some of the ways that um, uh, Danielle was just talking about, and Richard disorganize identity. Um, so it's for me, it's this constant um, interplay or back and forth between the oppressor the the. In, in theoretical debates, there have generally been an either or. Either the unconscious is radically revolutionary, like maybe Marcuse, or it's, an, it's a, a tool of oppression. And it's both. It's actually both. So, um, yeah, I think that, that's the answer that I would start with to your question. I want to say something about um, uh, your question, um, simply uh, to say this, um, there is, I think, a general um, reluctance um, to talk about the death drive. Now, some people think that this concept is nonsense. I totally understand uh, where they're coming from. Um, but um, I think where it is talked about, it tends to be talked about as something intrinsically reactionary, as geared towards fascism. Um, as geared towards pure uh, nihilistic, destructive energy, individualist, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, what I think, uh, first of all, just on an individual level, um, if, you, um, if you value your ego ideal too highly to an extent, you are living in a one-person dictatorship. The death drive in that context is a regicide plot. Um, I think, uh, in general, uh, broadened out, uh, uh, you know, through the contagious uh, systems that I was describing earlier, I don't have a better term for it, 
um, you can see how this can be a way, um, uh, uh, you know, this, this um, uh, can involve a, a, a destruction of some of the defenses, the political defenses that we have developed um, around identity, around who we are, what we believe in. Um, and, uh, you know, the beliefs um, that we um, uh, acquire, uh, you, you know, as the, the uh, theologian Tantillet points out, belief is something that comes after um, a, a sort of nucleus of enjoyment. And so if you can work the drive in such a way that it uh, just annihilates those beliefs, then something else can come uh, after that. I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up uh, the death drive, Richard, because um, if, if I were to you know, encapsulate what was I talking about earlier, it's very much the death drive. Um, particularly, I don't know if you've seen the paper that Derek Hook wrote about um, death drive as this kind of uh, force of you know, change and growth, um, particularly socially, um, because it, it's, it's in essence the idea um, that I would relate to what Fanon called the leap like not a leap of faith, because you know how you, if you're going to land, how you're going to land, but it's taking a leap irregardless of whether you land on your own two feet or a fall forever. And that it's that leap that introduces invention into existence. Like you have to push against every fiber of your being that says, don't jump, it's safer here on the ledge in order to introduce something uh, transformative and creative. I wanted to, to voice a question from someone in the, the Zoom chat, uh, a question from Ardalan, um, who asked, uh, which other personality styles or personality disorders are functional in these capitalist structures? Um, so I was, I was curious where, sorry about that. I was curious where you all might go from that question um, and starting to unpack that. Does that mean which other besides narcissistic? Is that what the question is? Well, um, I, I know I know paranoia, neoliberalism as a kind of, of universal paranoia is referenced as well. I mean, uh, I would I would note that Peter Fonagy has done a little bit of work, I think inspired by the work of Wilkinson and Pickett, um, showing that with kind of social democratic liberal countries, the greater the level of wealth inequality, the greater the, greater the prevalence of syndromes that are comorbid with borderline personality disorder. So higher likelihood of self-harm, higher likelihood of substance use, um, higher likelihood of uh, you know, not having enough social capital. And uh, I think at least one paper has argued that that, that would uh, affect borderline personality disorder as such that there's something about levels of development and uh, neoliberal policies that might lead to a proliferation of BPD or BPD-like syndromes in ways that you don't necessarily find in um, countries in the global south that have not engaged in neoliberal re restructuring. And that might speak to the kind of chronic invalidation that you experience just going on social media, going about the world, constant comparison, constant fragmentation of the self. It, so not just a, a devalued or an inflated self in kind of a narcissistic mode, but the fragmentation that comes with not really being sure of who you are and where you belong in a society that's so complex and so prone to social comparison. Uh, back in the 80s, which was kind of before social media, definitely before social media, I remember wanting to write a book about our culture in the United States being borderline. And I remember, um, and part, partly it was media, um, but even simple things like looking for a greeting card that actually said something meaningful. Either I would find, um, you are the most wonderful mother, <laughs> Uh, that the earth has ever produced, or you're an old bag 
and you like smell too it's too much so the only thing that was left was to buy a blank card uh, if you wanted to say anything that wasn't split as all good or all bad and there are television shows were like this you know so i mean i think borderline-ness uh, yeah is as is definitely even more uh encouraged with the the kind of social media and um former president that we just had in the United States. I don't um, know about, oh, I don't know about uh, categories, uh, you know, like uh, personality structures or whatever. Um, uh, but I would think um, the relation, the reference to social media or what I would call the social industry um, riffing on Adorno's uh, culture industry um, is uh, that um, uh, the 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 idea is that everyone has to be a celebrity now um you know you have to have your own essentially if you're on social media you have a, a pr strategy um you have a set of practices for how you're going to promote yourself how you're going to compete with other celebrities um uh, you know in terms of the structure of reflexive paranoia the the logic there is that you know it's a generalized competition anybody who is your friend could turn on you on the turn of a dime um, and, uh, but one of the things that I thought was quite interesting about, um, celebrity was that, um, you know, there's a well-known phenomenon where the, um, the icon, um, uh, the, um, you know, that, that represents you as a celebrity, your online avatar, your avatar as a Hollywood persona, whatever it happens to be, uh, expands and grows and metastasizes, uh, greatly at your own cost and uh, results in, um, you know, I mean, the, you just take a picture of yourself on Instagram, for example, put the filter on it so you look a bit better. It, it sort of um, smudges away any sort of wrinkles or blemishes, anything that in the sort of neoliberal gaze would be an imperfect imperfection. Um, and uh, you think, great, I look good. And you feel happy about that. But then basically you start to notice that People are liking this image that has nothing to do with you. They fall in love with this image um, and you have to keep servicing it and it's work. It's unpaid labor. And the more you engage with it and the more addictive it becomes, the more you're hooked into those uh, those patterns. Generally speaking, you know, the you know, celebrities have a higher propensity to um, self-harm, to kill themselves, um, you know, to uh, to. Uh, act out to melt down and of course we're fascinated with celebrity meltdowns we're fascinated with what's the horror behind the the, the image um and so um you know the the more that this is generalized the more that we're likely to um uh experience um you know the the distress of celebrities going on drunken benders you know whatever it is that you know that one can contemplate um the more we're going to experience that uh, ourselves uh, as a day-to-day -day reality um as the price the psychic price to pay for um having uh, you know a, a pittance of celebrity if from from what richard's describing and from his from what you said richard earlier um this is a a different language from from my general psychoanalytic language but a sadomasochistic character um, that arises from sadomasochistic relationships that are, um, you know, that are encouraged in all of our institutions, the hierarchy kills um, that you spoke to, uh, breeds sadomasochistic character. Character. Um, think of the work of Scanlon and Adlam um, on these sort of vicious cycles of sadomasochistic relating uh, that are part of uh, a neoliberal culture. I just wanted to jump in here with a question. It's quite a, um, like a clinical question about um, how all these ideas about the, the sort of impact of social structures, how they can be integrated into clinical work without preempting the transference and and sort of directing the meaning or still allowing for space for the symbolic meaning, whatever it is, whiteness or capitalism or something. Um, and also to avoid a sort of mutual idealization, I suppose, between the, the analyst or the therapist and, and the patient where, you know, all the badness is out there. I suppose that the death drive really is, is the answer to that. But 
yes, I, I th yeah, that's one of. I suppose these are the dangers of of sort of thinking uh, in these ways. You know, I can only speak partially to that. I, I, I don't know because I actually stopped practicing um, in 2014, but I, I do supervise. So I hear uh, about work that people are doing where they are taking social their social locations of themselves and the patient into account. And I think what, what you find is there are many more openings um, that, that arise in the work than we would have thought of if we we're only thinking in a psychoanalytic model that separates the social from the psychic. For one thing, dreams. Dreams always point out to the social world as well as to those intrapsychic, familial. Uh, so, but if you only ask the questions that focus on the intrapsychic and familial, um, you, you, you are in some way colluding with reproducing a certain kind of subjectivity. So, um, I think we need to expand our listening. Most of us have not been trained um, in a, a social psychoanalytic um, uh, kind of, of, of training, although many of us, particularly um, BIPOC folks, uh, are certainly <laughs> aware in ways that white people aren't of um, the effects of the social world. So I just think we would want to expand our concept of what's happening in the transference. Um, yeah. Yeah, similarly, I would say that even though I was trained in this kind of uh, multicultural, cultural competence mode and uh, in a way complemented by relational psychoanalytic thinking, I often found in my early clinical work that it could sometimes be a little hit and miss in terms of what's the relationship intimately between talking about issues of social context to this person's presenting problem. And even though I did it within the bounds that I was trained, I could always feel how clunky it could be at times because it was so um, sometimes dialogical and you have to really be careful about what you're projecting on the client in terms of your own values, what have you. And the shift really came for me when I started um, really just kind of sampling things from the Lacanian psychoanalytic literature, particularly the focus on language and signifiers and so forth. If you take into account this idea that we're constantly mapping ourselves out um, on this symbolic space that's both relational but also hierarchical, and if you understand that it is that representation of the world, the body in space, physical or symbolic, that our capacity for language comes from, then it does become a matter of what kind of language and what kind of themes you reflect back. So if, if somebody talks about relationships and you reflect back, oh, it seemed you felt very close to them, then they're gonna tell you more relationship stories and talk about closeness and distance. But if a client says, you know, I just don't feel that I am where I should be, that I'm not reaching my potential, that's much more hierarchical language. And I find that when you reflect back that language of hierarchy, um, it just leads these things to emerge quite organically, where you don't have to get stuck about just talking mommy and daddy issues, but it makes it so that in the signifiers of the client's linguistic universe, issues of race, class, gender, and sexuality come out organically, to the point that I really don't have to work very hard nowadays to talk about these things, because it becomes organic. Yes, I do still practice broaching in the way that I was taught to bring up issues of race and talk about it. But oftentimes when you take this more linguistic approach, you create a space where you allow both what's bubbling up in the transference and what's bubbling up again in the client's speech that is political in nature and inherently so to actually be elucidated and explored. So a very simple example would be uh, I had a client who was an uh, um, Afro-Latinx client who really avoided talking about anything related to race because they didn't want to offend or hurt me as a white Hispanic. But they would say things like, oh, I just remember growing up in my family's hacienda. Hacienda is a word that could mean big house, but it could also mean plantation. And just reflecting back that word, hacienda, 
led to other associations, which ultimately led us to talk about issues of skin and colorism in their family and ways in which they felt excluded. But anytime that I would try to concretely say, oh, I wonder how you experience race, et cetera, they would avoid, avoid, avoid. But this other approach allowed something to come out in a way that was normal, organic, and that set the table, as opposed to my just trying to talk about it, if that makes sense. I wanted to share a question from Carlos uh, in the chat. Um, because it seems to me to, to be a very interesting direction to turn um, from this kind of critique of, of therapeutic neutrality. Um, Carlos has said, um, could you say something about the ways in which psycho and psychoanalysts and psychotherapists might do more outside the clinical setting to address the racial dynamics and libidinal economy we've been scrutinizing here? not therapy. I'll just, I'll just jump out and say it. Like we, we sometimes have these very obsessional discussions of how to, you know, be political in our clinical work. It's clinical work. Like it's obviously important to figure out ways of talking about this in the care of our clients, but the answer to everything isn't psychotherapy. The answer to everything isn't more psychoanalysis. It means getting off the couch, getting into the streets, or get off the couch and join your local chapter of Democratic Socialism of America, or get off your couch and just get involved in actual political activity and organize it, right? So the, the short answer to this is not psychoanalysis. It means getting out into the world, living in your community, and getting engaged in politics through whatever medium that might be. But we do do this work in capitalist institutions. And, um, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who was, who I think this really speaks to what Danielle was talking about, was, was thinking about um, diverse, diversity in her organization and how do you make it be a welcoming space for, uh, that these are white dominant institutions, how they make it be a welcoming space for people of color. And then we started talking about how insurance has been like giving less and less reimbursement um, for, for the work. And when you start to talk about economic issues here, you, you think, um, why are we not agitating again? She, she had said that she wrote to the Massachusetts Psychological Association to complain about, like, why aren't we fighting the insurance companies? Um, so that not only wealthy people can um, practice psychoanalysis or that people are going off, what, what I'm seeing more is people are going off insurance. So who can they see if they're not accepting insurance, but insurance is paying so little. So the, the organizations that we're part of can be the first place where we do political um, organizing. And I, I, my understanding, you know, maybe you can speak to this, um, Luke and Lydia, my understanding is that that the Red Clinic is a worker cooperative, and that really is very inspiring to me. That um, and I think uh, some of the folks that I've been working with for a long time in a, on a project of a therapist project in Boston are now talking about starting a clinic. So I think we could learn a lot from you. I, I, I really uh, I really appreciated that, Lynn. Um, I, I I was curious um, around uh, this this uh, theme you brought up of the of the 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 way in which um, insurance in particular has started to to shape um, therapy. Uh, the the cap the the fact that we do this inside generalized commodity production. Um, shapes the frontiers for what we talk about and do. Um, and in particular, I was curious uh, what, what comments, what thoughts you all might have about the, the kind of dialectic between psychoanalysis as such and psychoanalytic psychotherapy, especially apropos of psycho, psychoanalytic psychotherapy has developed in large part um, out of what is um, commercially what what is commercially feasible? Um, what what insurance 
uh, will, will make possible in many cases. Such a hard one. You know, my psychoanalysis was invaluable and my analyst charged me, <clears throat> she, was a, she was in training herself and she charged me $10 a session and I couldn't have done it, you know, if that had not been the case four times a week. Um, it, 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 you know, there's, there's just, there's no question. There's like a two, at least two tier mental health system in, in the, in the U.S. If you have money, you can get like in-depth treatment four times a week. If you can come whatever hour, like two o'clock in the afternoon, this is only for, uh, you know, a certain echelon of, uh, wealthy people uh, to take advantage of now. And um, uh, um, so psychoanalytic psychotherapy is much more, it's much more possible as, as a treatment mode for, for most people, but the short-term movement, the, the way the um, insurance companies only will reimburse us and very little, a certain uh, amount of time for treatment, it is all really working against um, against good mental health, and and then the paperwork, the surveillance, audit culture that's all part of neoliberalism too has made most of the people I know go off insurance, which is it's kind of tragic actually. I can't say anything about insurance because um, it's not part of my experience here. I mean, I, I'm not a practicing analyst or anything like that. My only experience with psychoanalysis is that I've, I've been in analysis for about uh, eight or nine years or something. Um, and what I would say um, laterally in connection with this, um, uh, since uh, this does seem to be about class and affordability and uh, I think one of the things that um, uh, sort of if there is a resistance in psychoanalysis to dealing with class, um, if there is uh, a sense in which, um, you know, Joanna Ryan makes the case that uh, psychoanalysis has uh, dealt with uh, class issues very poorly, um, part of it may be uh, in the ways in which um, the whole uh, sort of setup uh, is designed uh, in a you know, outside of situations like the Red Collective, I would imagine, uh, largely designed in a petty bourgeois way. You set yourself up as a, a proprietor. Uh, if you can get um, sort of authorization from CIFAR or the New Lacanian School or whoever it happens to be, you can set yourself up and say, you know, you're, uh, you're a psychoanalyst. Um, and the uh, fees that get charged, while, you know, um, you know, I, I can just about manage them. I think if, uh, if I were on a lower income, I couldn't. Um, and I think that um, th therefore that, that model, that industrial model of uh, prov provision, um, it, it's unfortunate that that dominates. It goes against the grain of the cultural movement that psychoanalysis initially was, you know, the idea that there would be free clinics. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, even if not free, Patricia Gerovici makes the point that sometimes actually you need to charge something so that the analysant has some independence. And I would understand that. But, you know, to produce um, an economic model uh, for producing psychoanalysis that um, uh, can maximize its accessibility to people, because one of the big problems we have in the UK, I don't know if you have this uh, same thing in the US, um, is the massive prevalence of um, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which is the only thing you can get for free on the National Health Service, as far as I know at the moment. Um, and essentially, um, it's very short termist. Um, and in some ways, you could argue that it uh, alleviates suffering through obedience, uh, through essentially getting you to stifle your protest. Um, uh, you know, be it hysterical or whatever, um, in the interest of, you know, um, uh, accommodating yourself to reality um, and to your negative thoughts. Uh, so I, I think it would be um, it would be useful to think about whether psychoanalysis uh, has approached the issue of class, both in terms of how it functions in analysis and how it plays out at the level of uh, meaning and the production of discourse, uh, but also in terms of how psychoanalysis is itself constituted and made available.
thanks for bringing that up, Richard. Actually, I had meant to to um, <clears throat> to speak to that uh, before that when I was in graduate school in the 80s, psychoanalysis was the dominant um, mode in clinical psychology graduate programs. It is not at, barely present at all currently in clinical psychology programs, so that the whole idea of an unconscious is not part of training. Um, and uh, yeah, and to speak to, to your other point about class, is, which is equal, as equally scotomized as race is in psychoanalytic institutes, like the, that these are mostly all volunteer organizations where, you know, um, you can just give free labor from morning to night and think of yourself as a really good person. Um, and psychoanalysis in the United States was, you know, taken over by the medical profession early on in the 20th century, and um, even psychologists and social workers had to fight to get in. But again, like, what what did we fight to get into? It is definitely uh, uh, a profession that disavows, dissociates from class difference and and race difference. I just want to uh, say right quick and have to bounce out due to a situation. Um, but in brief, as somebody who is in psychoanalytic training, what I might say next might be anathema, but I also provide short-term psychodynamic therapy and I do teach and engage people with CBT. I don't think the problem is short-term versus long-term, psychodynamic versus CBT versus humanistic versus family systems versus et cetera. It, it, it's, it's all ways that we get pit against each other by a market. Like many people can benefit from 20 session, 30 session treatment. And many people are gonna need more than 20 session, 30 session treatment. And to be able to have a space where we can provide people the treatment that's tailored to their need so that they don't have to be in an unending eight year analysis, but they also don't have to be just booted out the door when the 12 sessions are up in a given healthcare system. For those reasons, I think the issues are primarily not even scientific, they're primarily political and economic. If we could create structures where people are provided the care that they need, regardless of their ability to pay, right at the point of service, we can sort of move away from giving people crumbs when they need life-giving water. So I thought I'd, I'd put that out there and uh, hopefully won't get kicked out of my institute by the end of the week. Thank you all so much, pleasure. All right, um, I, I, uh, I was about to thank Daniel uh, for, his, for his contribution, but he uh, popped off just a second before. Um, I think we have to start to wrap this up because that's the end of the allotted time, um, which is just good because I'm on, I'm on Paris time. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of running on fumes right now. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I just wanted to thank all the discussants again um, and uh, say that um, the, the Red Clinic um, is uh, getting started um, providing, uh, uh, providing um, psychotherapy uh, primarily in London, um, but also remotely. Um, and uh, Luke has done really tremendous work uh, getting it going. Um, and after the talk, um, after this is over, uh, attendees should look out um, for a, a survey um, in their email um, and some further info about the Red Clinic, um, just because uh, organizers um, wanted to get some thoughts and potentially connect with um, some of the diverse range of primarily other clinicians uh, who came to this talk tonight. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone again, um, Lynn and Richard and, Dan and Danielle in absentia um, and all hundred plus uh, attendees for coming tonight. Um, it's been a, a real pleasure um, and I hope uh, everyone else uh, learned something as well. Uh, I certainly did. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.